You said recently in a speech that if we keep having these terrible differences that we have, um, we will destroy each other. We have to find a way how to live together. Yeah. I spoke to one of the Republican candidates, former Governor Asa Hutchinson of mm -hmm. Arkansas, who said to me, give the candidates a chance to talk about the issues that the Americans are concerned about. Mm -hmm. Let's use appropriate language. Let's be clear that we have differences of policy, but that doesn't always make the person on the other side an evil person or somebody that doesn't love our country. Right. Do you think the Republicans will coalesce around that kind of message? No. <laughs> there's, there's no evidence that that's where the, the, their head is at right now. Now, that doesn't mean that that's not attainable over time. Uh, you know, I, I, look, I, it wasn't that long ago that I got a lot of Republican votes. It wasn't that long ago where John McCain was the Republican nominee and actively shut down uh, a, a speaker at a town hall who was saying that I was mm -hmm. a, a illegal alien bent on imposing Sharia law on the United States. Um, and, and there are still a bunch of folks who are more politically conservative than I am on social issues, on, on economic issues, but who I consider good people thoughtful people who I learn from and who I enjoy conversations with. And, and, and so the polarizations that we've seen in our national politics is not uh, identical to what's happening on the ground. But what is true is that partly beca uh, because of where people are getting information these days, the siloing of, mm. of information, if you are watching Fox News, I've said this before, if you're watching Fox News or following some uh, right-wing you know, radio host uh, or getting Facebook feeds within that bubble, your reality is different than if you read the New York Times or watch uh, your program. And uh, when, when people are getting such fundamentally different facts or what they think to be facts and, and, and their, their worldviews are so skewed in, in a one direction or another, then it's very hard for democracy to work. So this is the reason why I've been spending a lot of time both in the foundation and uh, in other work uh, talking about these problems of misinformation, not, not just the kind of misinformation that we see Putin engaging in uh, uh, in, in the Ukraine situation, not just um, during election time, but just this constant demonization of the other side, making people fearful of each other. And unfortunately, I think that's gonna be a, uh, a problem that uh, uh, gets even more pronounced uh, with the advent of AI and deep fakes and all these challenges. And we want to talk about that a lot with, with the, the leaders in the yeah. second part of this program. And I just wanted to ask you before I got to them finally, mm. race. Yeah. You're the first black president. Um, when pr Trump was elected, somebody who used to work for you and now is a, an analyst, Van Jones, said yeah. white lash. It was the white lash against yeah. a black presidency. Do you think the white lash is receding? And I guess combined with that, how do you interpret two candidates mm. uh, of color, Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, Tim Scott, senator of South Carolina, who is saying that Obama wants to keep essentially race as part of the of the equation, a part of the, you know, the conversation, and you have, you don't believe that, that everybody has an equal chance in the United States, no matter what their color. Well, I, look, I, I, I won't comment on what Republican candidates say. Uh, I'm not running, so they can, <laughs> they, they, they can find, find other ways to, to uh, occupy their time. Uh, I, I think race has always been the fault line in American life in American politics. That, that's not original to me. I think any observer of America would say that. Um, I, and by the way, that historically has not sort of been a, uh, a one-sided partisan issue. My favorite president, Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, did an awful lot uh, to advance the cause of freedom. And conversely, um, the Democratic Party was uh, where the Dixiecrats resisted. Uh, civil rights and, and, and progress for years uh, and imposed Jim Crow. So um, it, it is something that uh, America has had to grapple with for centuries. 
um, I think we have made real progress. And, the, the, you know, um, although I was always skeptical that my election somehow signified a post-racial America, if you look at any speech I gave throughout my presidency, I was always someone who reminded the country of the progress that was possible. Um, that was my brand, right? That's part of the hope and change thing. But <laughs> what I've also always said about hope was it can't be blind hope. It, 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 it can't be a willful ignorance to our history. We reckon with our history. That's how we then get better. Uh, that's how we perfect our union. You know, in the same way that Germany got better when it looked squarely at mm -hmm. what happened during World War II and came to terms with that. And that's part of why it is a thriving, stable, yeah. and increasingly diverse society. And, you know, that's part of the argument that I think um, all of us, uh, not just in the United States or in Europe, but around the world, have to come to terms with. Humans have a strong desire to coalesce, particularly during times of stress, around tribe, clan, race, uh, you know, uh, whatever our, our religious preferences are. Um, and politicians have a good way of exploiting that. And if we don't resist it, then we're going to have problems. And by the way, it's not just that, that us-them dynamic is not just around race. I would argue that in the United States, and I suspect in Europe as well, changing gender roles have, have fueled at least as much of a backlash as the racial backlash. This, this enormous fear uh, among men and uh, those who like the traditional structures and hierarchies and patriarchy uh, get very nervous when you have women suddenly being outspoken and thinking that they should have the same rights and power as men do. And when you have people of different sexual orientations saying, I'm here, I want a seat at the table, that has been very threatening. Um, and there's one last ingredient that I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. I do think there's an economic element to our democracy that we have to pay attention to. Our democracy is not going to be healthy with the levels of inequality that we've seen generated from globalization, automation, uh, the decline in unions, uh, the obscene inequality. You think about news of the day. Generally, we're not talking about news of the day. But right now, we have 24-hour uh, coverage, and I understand it, of this submarine, the submersible, uh, uh, that, that tragically is right now lost at the bottom of the sea. Um, at the same time, right here, in Ath just off the coast of Greece, we had 700 people dead, 700 migrants who were yeah. apparently being okay. smuggled uh, into here. And you know, we've, it's made news, but it's not dominating in the same way. And, and in some ways, it's indicative of the degree to which people's life chances have, have grown so disparate. It's very hard to sustain a democracy when you have such massive concentrations of wealth. And so part of my argument has been that um, unless we attend to that, um, unless we make people feel more economically secure and we're in, 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 taking more seriously the need to create ladders of opportunity and a stronger safety net that's adapted to these new technologies and, and the displacements that are taking place around the world. If we don't take care of that, that's also going to fuel the kind of you know, mostly far-right populism, but it can also uh, potentially come from the left, uh, that is undermining democracy because it, it makes people angry and resentful and scared.